Right, sorry about that. I just had to jump on mine here because we have a lot of people that will be watching online either now or later. So welcome to Good Friday. This is, uh, you know, it's a good Friday because we, we know how the story ends. It wasn't too good of a Friday on the day that Jesus actually was crucified, but because we know what it says in God's Word, we have a lot of hope today. We reflect on this day. We reflect on everything that God has done in our life, and we look ahead for Resurrection Sunday. Tonight, we're going to take a journey starting in the garden, and we're going to walk through the different places where Jesus walked. And we're going to finish with communion tonight. And we're going to finish in the upper room because in Acts chapter 1, 4, while Jesus was already, he, before he ascended, he showed himself to the disciples. But in Acts 1, 4, while eating with the disciples, he gave them a command. And that's what we celebrated yesterday. That's what Monday Thursday is about. Monday means command in Latin. And what was the command that Jesus gave last night before he was arrested? He demonstrated what it means to love one another. He did it by washing feet. He did it by letting go of Judas. You know, sometimes when people hurt you and offend you, sometimes the best thing to do is just let it go. Jesus let Judas go. He says, what do you have to do? Do it quickly. Jesus modeled how we love one another before he was arrested. And we're going to pick it up in the garden tonight. If you got your Bibles, let's go to Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 22. We're going to start there. The garden is a place of decision. When we look at the garden, it's a place of decision. And in Luke's Gospel 22, 39 through 46, it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw behind them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly as his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The garden is a place of decision. Jesus says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Jesus was in a place of decision as well. With all the weight of the world being, being put upon him, he was for a moment wondering, should I take the cup or not? But he says, Father, if you're willing to take this cup, yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus made a decision to go ahead with the plan. What parts of God's will, what parts of God's will do you still struggle with? Gee, God has a plan and a purpose for all of us. And I think at times we struggle with different parts of God's will. Jesus, for a moment, was like, Father, can you just take this cup from and so, so the application to us at times is, what are the parts of God, God's will that we're struggling with today? That's where we need help. Another question is, is, have you surrendered completely to God's will? Have you surrendered? You know, basic, very basic, have we surrendered our hearts and our lives over to Jesus Christ to become our Lord and Savior? But even as we are Christ's followers and disciples, we, we still have areas of our lives that he calls us to surrender. Are you being tempted to quit or give up tonight? You know, the enemy was in the garden. The enemy was trying to get Jesus to quit, trying to get him to give up, but he didn't. I love that scene in The Passion of Christ, if you've seen it. Jesus is praying in the garden and a, and a snake slithers out. And what, when Jesus gets up from his time of prayer, what does he do? He takes the heel and he... He basically fulfills the prophecy of Genesis to the serpent God's head. I'll crush your head. I love that scene. I love it when he gets up from prayer and he smashes the serpent's head to the ground. It's a sign that, hey, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to fulfill my Father's will. And at times we are tempted to quit, especially it says here the disciples were exhausted with sorrow. You know, Judas just left and betrayed Jesus. 
and they're, they know why they're in the garden because Judas is getting the Sanhedrin to come out there to arrest Jesus. So they're exhausted with sorrow. They're, they're wondering what's going to happen. And they're, so in times when we're full of sorrow and anguish, that's where the enemy wants to come in to get us to quit and wants to get us to give up. But, you know, Satan was defeated in the garden when Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. His father gave him the grace and the strength to endure what was coming next. To give the Satan the ultimate death blow. We see that in Colossians where eventually you'll see as we walk through this, Jesus made a public spectacle of the enemy by disarming him on the cross. And the key to this is Mark 14, 38, where Jesus again in Mark's gospel tells his disciples to watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. You know, sometimes we're, we go through tough times in our physical body. We're at the point of exhaustion, but our spirit, our spirit is alive. Jesus was encouraging his disciples to watch and pray and to be careful not to fall into temptation. And as we watch and as we pray, God will give us the help that we need so that we don't quit, so that we don't give up. And he will give us the strength to surrender those areas of our life over to the Lord. He will, he will show us what parts of, he'll give us the grace to help us fulfill the parts of God's will for our lives that are difficult and hard. So Father, as we look at the garden tonight, help all of us to make that decision. Father, we know at times the enemy is going to try to come in like a flood to get us to quit, to get us to give up. But Lord, we ask tonight as we spend time in the garden, give us strength. Father, even though our physical bodies are weak, our spirit is willing. So Lord, revive us, awaken us, help us to be watchful, help us to be prayerful in those times of temptation, Lord. Father, help us tonight to, to surrender our hearts over to your will. Give us the strength to give up those things that you're calling us to give up. And Lord, may we all pray Jesus' prayer. Father, not my will, but your will be done tonight. In Jesus' name. Next, we're going to take a step from, from the garden into the courtyard. Turn over to Matthew chapter 27, 26 through 32. The courtyard is a place of healing tonight courtyard. We go from the garden, now we're heading into the courtyard. In Matthew's Gospel, verse 26, they released Barabbas to them, and then he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the, sol then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns set it upon his head. They put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail the king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. You can go to Isaiah the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53, and he could read that and get a whole descriptive account of what Jesus went through and how he was suffered, how he was afflicted and bruised for our transgressions. As I look at the courtyard, as I reflect on that, healing and atonement started when the first drop of blood was shed. The first drop of blood that was shed brought atonement for our sin and brought healing to our sickness and diseases. The Bible says he's the Lord God that heals us tonight. Malachi 4.2 says he's the son of righteousness that rises up with healing in his wings. Do you realize that Jesus bled in seven areas? Seven is the number of completion. And the seven areas where Jesus bled reminds us that we have total and complete healing through the blood of Jesus. The first place where Jesus bled, he sweat blood in the garden. You know, the sweating of blood reminds us that his blood covers the temptations that come against us in everyday life. 
The flogging, the stripes on his back, one back are healing. When he was by his stripes, we are healed. When he was flogged in the courtyard, that his stripes on the back remind us that he won back our healing for our sickness and disease. Three, the bruises, the beating that he took, the bruises reminds us that he heals the internal hurts of our lives. The thorns, the crown of thorns placed upon his head, I love this because that shows us that the areas of the mind, mental health, mental illness is healed through the crown of thorns. He took on the trauma so that our trauma could be healed tonight. When they, the thorns on his head reminds us that the torment of the mind is healed. Also, the Bible says in Isaiah, they plucked his beard. They, they plucked his beard. As they plucked his beard, it reminds us that Jesus took away our shame. He took away our guilt tonight. The blood of Jesus covers our shame. It covers our guilt. The sixth place where Jesus bled was the side. They punctured a, uh, the, the soldiers poked a hole in his side and reminds us that he heals a broken heart. And he brings back our joy. The seventh place where he bled was his hands and his feet where the nail markers were. Shows us that he won back our authority. He won back our prosperity. Jesus took all of that for us. When his blood was spilled when in the courtyard, he was bringing that trauma upon himself so that all the trauma that we go through in life is healed through the blood of Jesus tonight. So as we look at the courtyard, as we observe the way Jesus was treated there, it reminds us that he did that for each and every one of us tonight. He did that so he could win back our healing. We serve a God who heals. We serve a God who delivers. And so, Father, tonight, as we spend time in the courtyard, we are thankful for your blood that was shed for us. That first drop of blood that was shed, Lord, you brought atonement, you covered our sin, and you bring healing to all of our sickness and disease. And, Father, right now, I pray for those tonight that need healing. You are the Lord God that heals us. And, Father, you are the God who heals cancer. You're the God who heals heart disease. Father, you took everything upon yourself. Those seven areas that you bled, you, you brought total and complete healing from the top of our head to the soles of our feet tonight. And Father, for those that are watching online and for those that are here, Father, I pray that your mighty hand and your outstretched arm would reach out and touch those that need healing. Father, I think of my friend Angie right now who, who is, um, he, she had to leave Mora to go get to deal with the area of the cancer in her lymph nodes. So, Father, we speak to the cancer on her lymph nodes tonight, and we say, be gone in Jesus' name. We command that cancer to shrivel and drive. We command it to leave and go. Father, if Angie is watching tonight, God, I pray that she feel the power of your presence touching her body right now, and we just plead the blood of Jesus over her. And, Father, thank you that you took that cancer upon your back and your blood was shed so that she could be healed tonight. So, Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would touch Angie and bring healing to her tonight. Lord, I think of, I think of Nancy right now, who I just got to report, God, that, that everything is good. That she that her cancer is not life-threatening. But, but, Lord, we pray, God, that she still needs a total healing, God. And, Lord, even as she's getting ready for chemo and other treatments, Father, we pray that you bring a total and complete healing to Nancy's body tonight in the name of Jesus. That your mighty hand and outstretched arm would just reach out and touch her where she is at now at the hospital, Lord. Just release your power and presence over her. We say, cancer, be bound, broken, and removed in Jesus' name. We speak to you like Jesus spoke to the fig tree. And we say, shrivel up and dry, but be gone in Jesus' name. And Father, release life and blessing over Nancy and Angie tonight. For they will not die but live to proclaim the testimony of Jesus tonight. Father, we lift up all others that have, that have gone, that need healing. I think of Dawn, who's recovering from, from knee surgery, God. We pray for a total recovery and healing. I think of Cheryl, who's at home recovering tonight. God bless her. May she have a fast, full, speedy recovery tonight, Lord, where doctors are just scratching their heads without wonder because you're healing and you're restoring people so that they could recover and be, be completely made whole tonight. Father, I speak, to, I speak to areas of the mind, a torment of the mind, thoughts or anxiety, depression. Father, I pray, God, that you bring healing to that tonight. Lord, the crown of thorns, the, the trauma upon our head, 
The trauma upon your head brings healing to ours. So, Father, we thank you tonight that you took the crown of thorns, that your head was wounded so our heads could be healed tonight. And, Father, those that are struggling with mental health or mental health issues, God, Lord, you took the crown of thorns for them. God, release healing to the mind tonight. Lord, your word says that you that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. God, restore minds tonight. Renew minds tonight. Father, we just ask that you come tonight. As we look, as we spend time in this courtyard, Lord, we're moving slowly through it because, Lord, you're bringing healing and restoration and deliverance. Father, we just pray right now that those that need healing tonight would feel a touch. Even as we go to the communion table itself tonight, we know there's enough power in the act of even in taking communion, God. I've seen testimonies of you bringing healing to people. So, Lord, even tonight as we're walking through the garden to the courtyard, now we're getting ready to go to the cross. And, Lord, there's healing tonight. There's deliverance tonight. There's salvation tonight. There, there's wholeness to, on the table tonight for us to grab. So, Father, release the fullness of your presence tonight upon those that need a touch from you. Just like the woman with issue, but all she did is she reached out and she touched the hem of your garment. She touched the prayer shawl. And something was released into her situation that brought, that brought healing and made her whole. Father, I pray as we reach out to you tonight, bring healing. Bring deliverance. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's jump in. This, this, as we walk out of the courtyard, let's make our way to the cross tonight. Let's, let's go back to Luke's gospel, Luke 23, starting at verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to a place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the other criminals who hung there hurled insults at him and says, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sentence, we're punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man's done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come in to your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts, they went away. But all those who had knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. As we go to the cross, as we position ourselves there tonight, the cross is a reminder, it's a place of salvation and forgiveness. The cross is where sin and death is defeated. The cross is a place of forgiveness. In his pain, Jesus modeled how we should forgive others. In his pain, he didn't wait till after the resurrection to forgive. It, it was in the middle of pain. 
where he shouted out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. As an example to us that when we're in our pain, when people hurt us, offend us, betray us, that we also can pray, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus modeled perfect forgiveness. He modeled perfect love. Romans 5 says that, that Christ demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross is the place where God makes everything right and where he begins to make everything new. I love this passage in Luke because it reminds me of two criminals, two guys. They did not live a good life up to that point. One made a decision to choose Jesus where the other one didn't. Even at that point, that one criminal who stood up for Jesus, even on the cross, that final threat, that final whisper, that, that final conversation he had with Jesus, that's all it took to, to, to make everything right for that criminal. And that gives all of us hope tonight. That gives us hope, that gives your family hope, that gives your loved ones hope tonight, that that, that, that criminal did not live a worthy life, but that final few seconds of his life when he, when he defended Jesus and, and when he cried out to Jesus, Jesus made everything right for that man. And he wants to make everything right for you and I. He wants to make everything right for your family members. The cross is a place where Jesus makes things right with him. You know, I love the parable of the, of, of, of the, of the landowner. It's just a reminder that, that you know, you know the, he needed help in his field, so he hired some workers to work in the field. And, and then, you know, then he needed more work, so he hired more. In the middle of the afternoon, some more workers went out to join the other hired hands. And then they realized he needed more work, so he hired some more guys to go out into the field. And at the end of the day, the... The businessman swears, it over, swears the wages away with, with everyone. And he gives a salary to the first group that they pretty much worked all day. And he kind of rejoiced in what they got. But then when the second group of workers got their salary, it was the same as the first. They got a little upset. But then, then as they're upset, the, the farmer or the owner gives the salary to the group that only worked a little bit. They got the same amount as everyone else. And now, but here's the point. It doesn't matter what time you come to Christ. The same deal is on the, stage, on the table. Whether you come in early, middle, or late, the same deal is on the table for everyone. Come to Jesus early in life. You can come to Jesus in the middle of your life. You can come to Jesus at the end. The same deal is still on the table. It's a beautiful reminder to us that, that there's always hope. In, in the beginning, the middle, the end of life, there's always hope. There's always a chance to make it right with Jesus. So Father, we come to you tonight. Just think of people right now in your life that need Jesus and just bring them in. Jesus, I pray that you bring my family. Father, whether it's the, the beginning, the middle, or the end, Lord, even the criminal who, who had a final conversation with you at the end of his life, Lord, he made things right. Father, I pray that make things right in our families tonight. Make things right for our sons and our daughters and our grandsons and daughters, Lord. Make things right for families that don't know you tonight. Father, position us in your life to, to be a beacon of hope. Lord, we pray for our community tonight. We, we pray for Mora and the surrounding area. Father, we know there's people in this town that still have not heard the message of Jesus. And Father, it's not too late for them. It is not too late for them. Father, we pray for our city to come to know you. We pray that every knee will bow, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, use us. Position us in, our, in, in the surrounding community to be a beacon of light and hope for those in need. To remind them that it's not too late. It's not too late to say yes. It's not too late to turn our hearts over to Jesus. Father, thank you for making everything right at the cross. Even though you were mocked, even though you were whipped and scourged while carrying the cross, you took the nails for us. People were yelling and screaming, but yet you said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Father, 
May we also have that strength, that same strength to forgive those that hurt us, that same strength to, to forgive those that, that, that talk bad about us, that scream at us. Lord, may we also forgive the way you forgive. Thank you for modeling perfect forgiveness for us tonight. And tonight, Lord, I pray that you give us, as we get ready to go to the communion table, that you give us the strength to forgive. That if there's anyone in our lives tonight that have hurt us or criticized us or Lord, may we also pray that same prayer that Jesus prayed. Lord, give us strength not to hold any grudges against those that have hurt us or wounded us. In Jesus' name. As we walked through the garden and the courtyard, and as we took some time to sit at the cross, man, we get to go to the tomb now. Let's go to the burial place. What? You know, for for Mary and the disciples, you know, taking taking Jesus off that cross and wrapping him in burial cloths and linens. And you have Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. John chapter three, Nicodemus was one of those guys that was curious, but. But you know that in the end, he, he bought an extravagant amount of, of myrrh. Says a lot, doesn't it? Joseph of Arimathea gave Jesus his tomb and said, well, how about we beg? He begged Pilate for the body. He says, let's, let's put Jesus there. So even through his burial, even through his death, that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were touched. I find it interesting that all the other disciples pretty much failed, but then you got Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus standing there. When his closest followers left him, there was Nicodemus and there was Joseph of Arimathea. It says a lot, doesn't it? The tomb is a place of hope, church. We know because this is our testimony. Paul even writes that in Corinthians, that this, this is it right here. This is our hope. This is why we're believers. This is why we can rejoice in trials and tribulations. This is why, because this is our blessed hope. We, it's the tomb. It's the empty tomb. It, it gives all of us hope in the room. And, and we know what's coming three days from now. We know what's coming Sunday morning, right? We, we know. We know how this story ends. We know how it plays out. We know how it's going to play out in the book of Revelation when our king comes back, but the tomb is a place of hope. But we still need to take a moment to reflect. Let's go to Mark 15. In verse 42. It was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. He is waiting. Joseph of Arimathea, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Jesus had an impact on his heart. Joseph of Arimathea went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some, bought some linen, linen cloth, took the body down, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus was laid. The tomb is a place of hope because the tomb, the Jesus' body being laid in the tomb, the stone rolled in front of it. It reminds us that it's a place where we could do all we can to prepare because this was preparation day. They, they had to take care of this before Sabbath. So they, were, they, they had to get the body down from the cross. They had to grab it and they had to get Jesus in the tomb before, before the Sabbath. So it's preparation it's a reminder to us that it's a place where we do all we can and prepare. It, it's a place of waiting. It's a place of planting. See, I believe Jesus 
He was a seed planted. Because when he was planted in the tomb, something grew after it. Something rose. It's like we plant the seed in the ground and, 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 and sprouts and things pop from the ground. It's just, Jesus was a seed that was planted. The tomb is a place where we let go. It's a place where we rest. It's a place where we let go. You see, it's the, they had to get everything done for preparation for the Sabbath. It's a reminder that there's just some point in our life we only could do what we could do. We just have to turn it over to the Lord and have faith. That's what the tomb, that's what the, that's what the closed tomb represents. It's, it represents we have to do our part. Woo, but church, when that, tomb, when that stone is rolled over it, God's going to do his. That's why the empty tomb is so good for us. It's because it reminds us that there's a part of the story that we do, and there's a part of the story that he takes over and does. It's impossible for us to move, to remove the stone. I always, I always, re, I'm just reminded as we, as the stone is, is rolled over to close Jesus in, the Lord just reminds me, the stone is not your problem, Steve, it's mine. The stone is not your problem, it's his. And guess what? Your third day is coming. See, we always have hope. There's a hope of a third day. If you, if you look from Old Testament to New Testament, study all the third days. Third day is a reminder that something's coming. It's a reminder that life is coming. It's a reminder that new life is coming. It's a reminder that a miracle is coming. When you look at all the third days from Genesis to Revelation, third day gives us hope of a resurrection and new life. There's a third day coming. As we, as we, as that stone was rolled over, it reminds us that, okay, I've done all I could do. Now I need a rest. I gotta have faith. Faith is being at rest when you've done everything he asked you to do. When you've been obedient to everything that God has called you to do, we just have to have faith. Okay, we've been obedient. Joseph of Arimathea was obedient. He did everything what he could do. Now he has to apply faith. Because it says here in this passage, he was waiting. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. Sometimes you just have to wait. And waiting stinks. In America, we want it now. We want it fast. We don't want to wait. We don't want to rest. But, but in God's kingdom, six days you work, the seventh day you rest. Why? Because in his kingdom, you don't rest from work. You work from rest. God does his best work when we rest. Because it's a reminder that it's not on us. It's on him. The tomb is a place that reminds us that we just have to have faith in the waiting. We have, it's like, it's like a picture of this. There's just, as I, the more I've served God over my life, I begin to learn more and more that, that there's just some things about God that's a mystery, okay? The more you serve him, the more mysterious he gets. And I'm at a point in my walk with the Lord that I'm okay with the mystery. I don't have to have it all figured out. Because I just know there's just some parts of the Lord I'm never going to understand. And I'm never going to figure it out. That's okay. That's the mystery. And we have to be at peace in the mystery. We have to be at rest in the mystery. We have to be at rest in the times of darkness. When that, st that stone rolled across the opening uh, of the tomb, it created darkness inside. We have to be at peace even in times of darkness. We have to have hope in the darkness. We have to have hope and faith and wait even when it's dark. We have to have hope, okay, the stone's not my problem. I know a third day is coming, but boy, we can get it in our head, but it's hard to live out sometimes, isn't it? You know, when you're in a dark, dark, dark place, and you've known you've done everything you could do with your own strength, but now all you have left is the weight, that's hard. And the flesh does not like doing it. But we have to have hope. And we have to have faith. Third day's coming. Stone's not your problem, it's his. And the good news is, is that that's where we pick it up on Sunday. <laughs> we have three days of waiting. Three days to wait. We have to wait from now until Sunday. Tell you what, when you're going through a dark time, that's a long time to wait. 
But when we anchor ourselves in the mystery and the truth of who God is, when we have that track record, when we've seen Passover played out from the Old Testament to the New, we know that this is our victory week. Passover is our vi victory week. The crucifixion is our victory. The, the Jesus buried in the tomb is our victory because resurrection day is coming. We know how this story is where we have hope. And like I preached on last Sunday in Acts chapter 12, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during the Passover, what did God do while the church was praying? Peter had a miraculous escape from prison. Why? It wasn't by chance. The church was praying. God's timing was perfect. And Peter was able to escape from prison because God sent an angel to send him out. It was during the week of Passover. It's a reminder to us that, that, that during this week, we can expect to believe that God can do great new things and do great miracles. As we look at the Passover, it's a reminder. This is our testimony to a world that needs God, that God is truly a deliverer, that he is the one true almighty God. And that when he performed, when he rolled that stone away in the morning, and when Jesus walked out, that was his very best work. And, it, and it's a sign to the world that I'm the one true almighty God. Nobody can do what he did. That's our testimony. That's our life. That's our story. We're a part of it. So, Father, tonight as we, as we stand outside the tomb and the stone roll, Lord, it's a reminder to us that we have hope. Father, we know that there's just so many things that we can do and then we just have to trust. Father, it's hard to trust in the dark times. It's, it's hard to trust you when it looks like things are dying. It's hard to trust you when, when we're going through a mysterious time when we're doing what's right and we're being obedient, but yet we still don't know completely what's going on. Lord, it's hard to have faith like that during times like that. But tonight, Lord, Thank you for reminding us the tomb is a place of hope. It's where we apply our faith. It's where we wait. It's where we rest. And it's the preparations, Lord. As we've done everything, we need to stand. And we need to stand firm. And, but, Father, it's hard to stand firm when you're in darkness. It's hard to stand firm when it seems like we're surrounded by dead things. It's hard when a, a stone that's pretty much immovable by our own strength, but yet we have faith that you're going to come through. We have faith that you're going to bring back something to life that is dead. We have faith and hope in the resurrection. We have faith and hope in new life. We have faith and hope in deliverance. We have faith and hope in, in, in you bringing salvation to us in our situation. When it looks like our back is against the wall and everything looks impossible, Lord, this tomb reminds us there is hope that you are the God of the impossible tonight. And with that, we enter into communion. If you're with us online tonight, we're going to end by taking communion together. And if you have communion, you can take the elements. Now, they're here in person, it's two levels. The top layer is the wafer. The second layer is the is the juice. It's like I said earlier, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, after Jesus was risen and he appeared to his disciples, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says that while they were eating, Jesus gave them a command to wait for the gift that my Father has promised. He commanded them in a few days to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. So you look at the different times Jesus ate. Even after he ascended, he, he reinstated Peter. He called Peter back into ministry. He, he, they, had a, they had a short lunch. And, 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 and Jesus pulled Peter aside. And three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times Jesus said, you know, gave Peter a chance. Say, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I do. And Peter was reinstated. Jesus appeared to his disciples. And we end in the upper room with an anticipation that, God, what are you calling us to do? What do you, that same power that, that raised Jesus from the dead, Paul says, lives and dwells inside of each and every one of us. That, that power that, that allowed Jesus to rise up and that power is real, church. And, and, and then we trust the working of the Holy Spirit. Now, that same power dwells in us. 
When we pray, God can do things. When we're obedient, God can still do miracles. And, and tonight, we go to the communion table. We remember, you know, we realize that, that his blood and his broken body covered everything. It, it brought us all back into relationship with God tonight. As we, as we stroll through the garden, and as we walk through the courtyard, and we stood at the cross and stood outside the tomb, we take communion with an anticipation that God is going to make all things new again. That we take communion to remember those things. We remember the courtyard. We remember the garden. We remember the cross and the tomb. But now, we also take communion with anticipation of our home called the eternity, called heaven. We take communion with with joy tonight because we know how this story ends. We know there's a resurrection. And we know there's a king coming back for his church. And we know that one day there's going to be a wedding supper in eternity that his sons and daughters will be a part of. That you and I, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your name is written in the book of life and you're on the invitation list and you're going to have a place setting at the wedding supper of the Lamb where you'll be able to hear testimonies and share your testimony with others while the headmaster gets ready to share his. We get to take communion tonight with joy with anticipation that one day we will meet our Savior, we will meet our King, and we will sit at a wedding banquet with Him as our headmaster. We will all be in awe. It's hard to wrap our mind around what that moment will look like, what it will feel like. We read it in Scripture, but when you try to think about it, when you try to meditate on it, it just gets a little too overwhelming because we know it's going to be bigger and better than we can imagine. And that should put, give us all hope. Even right now in our world where things are broken and things are just not in the right frame of mind or place, but yet we can take communion and reflect on our, on the, on our heavenly home. And for a moment, it helps, us, it helps us get us to a place of heavenly reality rather than earthly reality. And when we, when we take the bread and the cup, it just reminds us that God gives us great grace and strength to endure, to persevere, to overcome, even in difficult times, because our testimony is the resurrection. So as we close tonight, and as we take communion together, remember, we walked through the garden tonight. We walked through the courtyard. We stood at the cross, and we spent time at the tomb, and now we're in the upper room, awaiting the resurrection. We know that Jesus already rose from the dead, but now what we're waiting for, we're waiting for our resurrection. We're waiting for the day when the trumpet call will sound and we're all coming home. That's called the blessed hope. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He says, take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. As we break the bread tonight, it reminds us that Jesus was broken so we could be healed. As we, as we take the bread, it reminds us that he is our perfect provision. When we don't have any provision, the broken bread is a reminder that he provides, just like he fed for the feeding of the 5,000 tonight. The broken bread re reminds us that it's a reminder that we're all broken servants. When Jesus broke the bread, he, he's like he was broken so that he, he served and he, he used the towel to wash his disciples' feet tonight. And when we take the bread, it's a reminder that he's our provision, that his body was broken so we could be healed. And it's a reminder to us that we're called to be broken servants to serve others in need as well. So as we take this bread tonight, Father, we take this bread and we thank you. That even tonight, Lord, as we take this as a step of faith, we, we, we take this bread knowing, God, that you, you are our perfect provision. You supply and meet all of our needs. This bread reminds us that you were broken so we could be healed tonight. And this bread reminds us that you were broken. You were a broken 
his servant that brought healing to the world. Lord, may we be broken before you. May we be broken before others as we serve them, as we humble ourselves, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, not just to remember, but to anticipate what heaven will be like as we sit at the wedding supper with you. In Jesus' name, let's eat together tonight. On the night that Jesus betrayed, took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of my new covenant. This blood is the new covenant of Jesus. He said, we, as we spent time tonight in the court, in the, in the garden, Jesus was saying, Father, take this cup from me, but yet not my will, but your will be done. This cup is a reminder that Jesus did not quit or give up. He went through not just the crucifixion, but he went through the flogging and the beating in the courtyard so that we could be healed tonight, so that he could cover our sin tonight. This is also the same cup one day when Jesus will lift it up at the wedding supper. He, you know, he said the next time we'll drink together will be at the wedding supper. The blood of Jesus tonight sets all of us free, church. The blood on the doorpost is what protected the Israelites. The blood of Jesus sets all of us free. The blood of Jesus protects us from the work of the enemy, the plans of the enemy, the harassment of the enemy. His blood was shed so that we could be set free tonight. His blood was shed tonight so that we could be healed. His blood was shed so that our sins would be forgiven and atoned for. The blood of Jesus, when we drink it, just doesn't cover us on the outside. When we drink it, it goes down deep into, into the innermost parts of our body to cleanse us, to heal us, to restore us, to transform us tonight. So, Father, we thank you for your blood. We thank you that your blood has set us free. We thank you that your blood protects us. We thank you that this is the shed blood of your son, Jesus, Father. It, it's the new covenant. We thank you, God, that this new covenant was better than the old one, and we thank you for that. It's not about the, the, about the shedding of animals anymore. It's about the, the shed blood of, of, of the Lamb of your Son, Jesus, that brought atonement. Lord, thank you, God, that we don't have to go through what our forefathers had to go through regarding sacrifices. Lord, thank you that you sent your Son to be the ultimate sacrifice. So all we had to do is accept him by faith and take him into our lives and our hearts and believe it, receive it, and speak it, Lord, that we have faith and salvation in your son Jesus tonight, Lord, we thank you. We so thank you that your blood also protects us, protects our families. Your blood shields us and from the enemy and his plans and his works. And so, Father, as we take this cup, we take it with joy, knowing that if we remember everything that you did, but we also take it with joy in anticipation of what you're going to do in our future as we sit at the wedding supper. It's going to be a time of joy. It's going to be a time of gladness. It's going to be a time of laughing and singing, rejoicing. And with that, Lord, we gladly accept this cup and we take it tonight. In Jesus' name, let's drink together. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you for this time that we got to spend in your presence tonight. Now, Lord, help us to continue to reflect on what you've done as we anticipate Resurrection Sunday, mm -hmm. as we anticipate a glorious day in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and to celebrate and to reflect and to remember and, and, and taking that stroll from the garden all the way to the tomb, ending with communion together. It's a great time just to kind of walk through those moments and trying to put ourselves in the story, put ourselves in the moment to really feel and, and try to understand what Jesus went through so that we could have a deeper appreciation for what he did. We invite you to come back on Sunday morning. We want to thank you, those of you that were watching online tonight. Sunday morning, where the message I have is from, from Rags to Riches. We're going to focus 
on the linens in the tomb. There's a message in those linens that were left behind. There's, there's a message of hope for us. There's something for us to hold on to and grab in that moment. So we're going to talk about that this Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. If you're, if you're with us for the first time tonight and you need a church home, we invite you to come to Living Hope Church. We want to thank you for joining us online tonight. We know that there will be many people that will chime in later to watch because of their work schedules and such. But we want to thank you that you took time to join us tonight. We do have some ways that if you want to give to the ministry, you could, we have online giving through our website as well as you can text uh, Mora Hope to the number 77977 or we have offering boxes at the entry points and we have envelopes if you want to if you feel free to, to give tonight. We're just so thankful of the, what the Lord's been doing in this season and we're looking forward to what he has in this next season. Next Friday, a quick announcement next Friday, if you can watch on our website as well as our Facebook page, next Friday at 4 o'clock in this parking lot, we'll have a semi-truck here. And uh, we have estimated about 1,200 boxes of food that we're going to distribute to needy families in our city. So we have people that are going to help. If you're looking for a place to volunteer, um, we're just going to have people at 4 o'clock. People will be driving through and we'll be passing out um, groceries. It's from an organization called From Farmers to Families. And these are like local farmers that have extra stuff they want to donate, meat, produce, etc. that that there will be all boxed up so when people drive through, every family will get a box, a good assortment of groceries. And um, we've been working with the schools and just trying to get the word out to our community. The food shelf of Mora is aware of that. And we're excited. There's already been a big buzz um, on our What's Happening Kennedy County page as well as people are asking questions and sharing it. So if you're looking for a place to help serve or be a part, or if you know of any families in need, um, encourage them to come next Friday at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock is when we'll start. Um, we're not going to let people line up early. 4 o'clock is start time. That's go time. So we will, if people start lining up ahead of time, we're going to have to tell them to go because we just got to get a lot of things set up. But right when 4 o'clock hits, boom, it's going to be go. And I believe it will be, there's going to probably going to be more than enough cars <laughs> that will come through to that time. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. When, we just wish you all a, a great Passover week and, and a happy resurrection uh, weekend from our family to yours. Thank you so much, and, and God bless, and thanks for joining us tonight.